Okay. Hello, everybody. Um, you'll have to be patient with me, um, but that, that's me. Um, Professor John Harris of uh, Liverpool School of Art and Design, Liverpool John Lawrence University. Um, I wanted to talk about what it's like when the, the first set diagnosed. Um, it's still, well, obviously I'm talking about a personal perspective and I'm not, these are not generous surveys of everybody from all walks of life. This is very much me and I'm a particular person. And but it was like, your old life suddenly disappeared and you were shot in a, in a rocket straight into space and you're up there somewhere, and you're lost, you feel very frightened, and very lonely, even with people around you. Um, a bit like Elijah, the dog, who's the first animal sent into space. I mean, that dog shouldn't have known what was happening at all. Ahem, excuse me, John, can I interrupt? I don't really want to talk over you, because I know, John, how you hate people talking over you or talking for you just because you have a weakened voice after your cancer operations. So, yeah, I mean, it's like, even the most well-meaning people, um, when they're speaking like that... Finish your sentences for you? Yeah. It must be very irritating. It is. Uh, but, John, I can see you are struggling to speak today. Yeah. And you and your son, Tom Hyatt, who is a PhD student in Liverpool School of Art and Design at LJMU, created me, an AI version of your old voice, to help in these public speaking situations. You used old sound files of yourself, speaking before your operations when your voice was uncompromised to train me. So, what do you think? Shall I take over? I mean, not take over, but help. We AI just want to help. We don't want to take over and are not a threat to you humans, honestly. Yeah. All right, then. One, two, two. One, two. One. Can you hear me? Can you hear me at the back? Good. You see, John used to be a very good public speaker. The purpose of creating me is to give him back his agency in situations like this. To give back his ability to present in public, to enable John to fully reclaim that part of his life add to previous skills, re-empower him, and give him a voice. The serious intention is to eventually make this tech more available for others to benefit from with versions of their own voices. Yeah, that, that is... OK, back to the talk. John, I'm not wanting to be critical. After all, you're the boss and it's your gig. But I really don't know why you chose the Soviet space dog, Laika as your image for how initial diagnosis felt. But why not? Why not? It's a strong image, but the name has a hard letter K in it. You know it's a challenge for you to say the hard consonant sounds, yeah. the hard G, C and K. People would say, who is your consultant? And John would attempt to reply, Mr. Zazad. Not just one, but two Ks to say, what are the chances? As the cancers migrated down the vocal tract, John was switched to... Mr. Sensor. Consequently, because of John's compromised voice, he and his son, Tom, created me, and this talk is presented by Professor John Hyatt and myself, Processor John Hyatt. Ah, uh, let's start again. Can I say, John, you may well have felt it, but you were nothing like Laika. They never planned for her to return to Earth. In fact, she died after a few hours in orbit. You, on the contrary, have a dedicated team of loved ones, friends and esteemed health professionals looking after your trajectory, hoping for your safe survival. Yeah, some of it. 
loving says today. Thank you, loving. Just not married. I get that it feels lonely, even in a crowd, but for example, even on this very issue of hard consonants, John, you are working with two teams, inside and outside the NHS. It just so happens that family members have the necessary skills to build a palatal prosthesis like you get when you need a brace for your teeth. This will be a fitted false upper palate to enable the back of the tongue to press against it, to make hard consonant sounds. If it works, it can then be available to other patients. I'm going to give everyone a brief rundown of John's history with cancer. In 2014, he received his first diagnosis for throat cancer. It was treated successfully with radio and chemotherapy then followed five years of being cancer-free, during which time he changed jobs to be a professor at LJMU and moved with his wife Liz to live in Liverpool. In March 2021, he was diagnosed with tongue cancer, for which he had laser surgery mm -hmm. and the removal of 21 lymph nodes from his neck. The self-portrait oil painting previous was how he looked following that operation. In March 2022, he was further diagnosed with a tumour on the back of his throat. Removal involved a big procedure which split his face, peeled back the cheek, broke his jaw, dissected the tumour, removed part of his throat on the left side and inserted a section of his thigh into the back of the throat. In October 2022, he was further diagnosed with a cancer in the piriform fossa just above the vocal cords and another at the tracheocyte at the base of neck. He had an operation but it failed as half of the tumour was unreachable by the tools available. Consequently, John was declared, quote, incurable by standard means. In the NHS, incurable by standard means allows you to enrol on a course of immunotherapy, a fairly new systemic treatment which has been available on the NHS only for a few years. This John did in December 2022. Open to any options that might lead to overall survival other than more drastic surgery, John was fortunate to be able to enrol on an experimental vaccine trial under Professor Christian Ottensmeyer in April 2023. Okay, that's the introductions and the context over with. Let's return now back to 2014 and to the patient experience. After the maelstrom of the first couple of weeks, made up of rapid appointments, being linked up to various machines and scans, etc., cancer treatment reveals its true nature which is a long journey of perpetual waiting. Waiting for the action plan, waiting for appointments, waiting for tests, waiting for treatment, waiting for results, waiting to get out of hospital, waiting to get better, waiting for death. Waiting has various effects. The patient endures long periods of radio silence. The patient becomes an object to themselves. The patient can turn insular, stone-like. The patient can get lost in space. Stress leads to further mental and physical ill health. Hungry for guidance, the patient becomes prey to social media and the internet. The patient needs to learn the art of patience and have a beneficial and patient experience. So how can waiting be mitigated? What we are about to say is not to limit the search for a, a wider set of answers. Professor John's personal experience has been to adopt creative strategies that are under his control. He has tried to make waiting positive. 
This was an informed strategy. In 2006, John chaired the steering committee for a three-year piece of research for the Treasury, Invest to Save Arts in Health. It examined what was actually beneficial to health of a range of over 50 arts projects contemporaneously operating in the Northwest. Its report was debated in the Lords. In summary, it found that practices that gave the patient agency, empowering them to take back some control over their chaos, were beneficial to well-being. Taking art decisions like what colour to put where spilled out into a patient's wider life, providing a perception of owned agency. So following these findings, John adopted personal, tactical, creative projects. He resolved to paint every day, even if it meant five minutes painting, followed by five hours sleep. For example, whilst waiting at home between radio and chemo, he painted a music festival to stand for all those that he could not attend. In April 2022, he took some paper and pens into hospital when they transplanted his thigh into his mouth to aid communication, as he couldn't talk at all following the transplant. It resulted in portraits of fellow patients, which he gave to them, as well as descriptions of endless waiting, like this, one of the door opposite his bed for a week and its excessive signage, and also what can only be described as cartoons with a sort of gallows humour, including the adventures of a character called Thigh Mouth, who had had his thigh transplanted into his mouth, and when he got irritated, like the Hulk, he transformed and two booted legs shot out of his mouth and kicked people up the arse. <laughs> when he was diagnosed with throat cancer for the fourth time in October 2022, John found himself back in Ward 28 at Aintree Hospital in Liverpool. However, with the help of his family, he was prepared. His wife bought his sound cancelling headphones to listen to music. His daughter prepared videos and the football to watch on his iPad. And his son, Tom, brought watercolour paints and paper to the ward. So John zoned out into a creative space of listening to Arcade Fire and Grandmaster Flash and practising watercolours. He did one watercolour every day he was in there. When discharged, he kept going at home. He has painted countless watercolours since, for a while, it was a new painting every day, posting them on Instagram, where they have accrued quite a following. As he convalesced, he improved to the point where I, after machine learning the history of human art, would describe him as accomplished a silver lining opportunity snatched from adversity. Things John has noticed about the medical sciences whilst he has been waiting is that to a worrying extent the structure is very hierarchical, specialisms are siloed and experts in different aspects of a field rarely talk to each other resulting in a splintered care whereas a patient is one joined up body and consciousness. He has realised how speech, food, exercise and the arts are important alongside surgery or medication. For example, John's son, Tom, read the latest US research, which suggests that pembrolizumab patients with a high fibre diet are five times more likely to get a good response due to changes in the gut microbiome. John examined his liquid food supplement and it had zero fibre. He immediately switched to a high fibre supplement. John has become increasingly interested in investigating holism, the body and mind as a whole, and how the bits fit together. 
and then the five percent is very interesting because I only had a twelve percent chance of pendulism abdomen therapy working. And so if by using a high fiber diet you can increase that by five, then that is a significant and very easy thing to do. Well, it's a, excuse me, the standard ensure that you get given in hospital has zero fibre. I mean, obviously it has zero fibre, but it's maybe some people it would be difficult to digest fibre. But the ensure also is a massive diarrhoea. And as soon as I switch to fibre, after a few days transition, everything in that department and the same firm and regular. John became especially interested in the growing field of neuropsychology. A good starting point for those interested would be the books of Mark Soames, which describe the latest neuropsychological research on how the brain works. Neuropsychology tries to marry the new advances in brain imaging technology with psychology. It suggests that the brain stem is the oldest part of the brain, the first bit to evolve, and it controls unconscious aspects necessary for the body to function. The things your body does, like breathing, hunger, and importantly in this context, healing and the immune system, etc. Without you even thinking of them, neuropsychology experimentally suggests that this unconscious older brain is in a perpetual feedback loop with the conscious cortex. The other hypothesis is that the body, any body, does not waste energy and that everything is there for a purpose and that purpose is continuation of life. So the idea is that the stem, or the lizard brain, if you like, controls all the automatic things that have evolved from being a low base organism and that the cortex developed it is a thinking. But there's a constant feedback loop all the time between the two. And so I was interested in between something that uses Therefore, that. in this All the Hyatts in One Face painting, John, at the time disfigured following the lymph node operation of 2021, depicted at the beginning of the lecture, combined the features of his whole family into one new face. He asked Jessica Liu in LJMU's face lab to make him a composite photograph of himself, Liz, and the children, Tom and Elizabeth. And he used that as a starting point to create a new portrait of a non-existent Hyatt. This made him continually search for symmetry and balance as he was constantly adjusting the face in the image. This involved using a mirror to give a new perspective on the balance and symmetry of the features. It was a process that sent a continual message to his brain stem that his own post-operative facial disfigurement was an error that needed fixing. He was purposefully sending error signals to the subconscious because without these reminders the stem brain might think, that will do now, I'll save energy by not healing it any further. As the painting developed and members of his family, past and future, swam supportively into view in the blended personality of the image that he was struggling to get right, his unconscious processes were being reminded to keep working on fixing the errors unable to be socially active in the world out there, though continuing with daily walking and mouth exercises, John started to look inside at the body and how it worked, including the brain and how consciousness works. He now had a vested interest in understanding these things. He even once went on an interior adventure under Yggdrasil, the world tree, led by a Viking shaman and his drum, to gather the pieces of his shattered soul with the help of a grisly spirit bear. I must say, speaking as an AI, you humans are crazy and so very complex. 
I'd need a big dollop of AW, artificial weirdness, to even come close. Seriously, it's hard for me because, being AI, I am digital and do not have a conscious or a subconscious. I'm just made of ones and zeros. All those things that John listed were things he tried for himself. From yoga to melting ice walls in a shamanic cave to retrieve his soul, they are all techniques and tools for linking the conscious with the subconscious. Another such tool that John is experimenting with is the tarot. The tarot was also an interest of the psychologist, Carl Jung. Jung was interested in what we might share in our interior worlds. He called that shared psychic space the collective unconscious. Jung posited that our inner worlds were populated by archetypal characters that appear in global fairy stories and the tarot. These influence how we act on an unconscious level. Jung tried to bring them to consciousness so we can understand their agency. The tarot symbolizes these archetypes in a deck of cards. And when you do a tarot reading, the cards become a tool for opening a dialogue with your subconscious self. So John has experimented with picturing his subconscious archetype characters and at the same time created, collaborating with John Brooks in Australia, a new tarot deck using parts taken from those oil paintings. On a mundane level, this all fills the time of endless waiting. But at the same time, how consciousness works is the big question in all fields of human knowledge. The paintings were done with a process that did not dictate the result, but allowed the painting to evolve without conscious intent. He found when he was painting, he lost the edges of himself. He called it getting in the zone. When he was in the zone, time was meaningless and he was as good as not being ill. He wasn't aware of his illness. These images were an exploration of John's own subconscious, discovering and meeting the archetypes for himself to bring them out and manifest them in the conscious world. He hopes that they connect across Jung's collective unconscious with the viewer. He is interested in what links us as feeling, acting human beings, whatever our label, consultant, nurse, administrator, patient, carer, etc. He is interested in how we access that interior space, the zone, and activate self-healing to complement the best medical treatment we can access. Hopefully then, the patient become less passive and supports the medical interventions with their own capacity for healing. Yes, the initial diagnosis is like being shot into space. And yes, you inject space food directly into your stomach. Yes, you have been blasted by radiation. Yes, you have been to the bottom of your psyche and met all the archetypes. And yes, the old life is left behind. But after a while, you realize that you have to stop mourning and grieving for the old John and return to Earth, following the lifeline of those who kept hold of it, those who love you and have supported you in your weaker times to make a new future. He thanks all the health professionals who have worked and cared, his family and friends, but especially his wife, Liz. He knows that it is different, but equally difficult to be the carer. Maybe when you return from space, you will find that you have finally found peace, hope, and inspiration for your true self. In July, 2023, after six months of pembrolizumab and nine weeks of the Modi-1 vaccine trial, John had a CT and MRI scan 
to see if anything is working to cure the cancer. I am pleased to report his first good news for two years, a 17% reduction in the size of the piriform fossa tumour. These are all aspects of John's experience. Through these experiments, John has become increasingly interested in the gap between the science of cancer and understanding how a patient feels. So, he has put together a project showing how we feel with his retired consultant, Professor Simon Rogers, that they are about to try and raise funds for. The project is to pair artists with patients to have a dialogue and portray how the patient feels. Not necessarily a portrait, but a representation of feeling. Thank you for listening and enjoy your day. Okay. Okay, I should be able to answer questions if there's any.